I had an eating disorder, mm -hmm. and I think it was from just being thrust into a high pressure, uh, competitive environment. They were scared that if I went to like an actual like art art school, oh, um, yeah. I would just turn into like a an artist. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> I do music full time, but I also supplement that income with uh, painting, like, like paint guitars for people. Started with my friend, my dear friend David, David Damiak. We've known each other for like eight years. Hi, this is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk. Today I'm here with Yvette Young. Hey. <laughs> so you're born in San Jose? Yes, I'm born and raised in San Jose. Yeah. yeah. Are your parents from there as well? Um, my parents are from Beijing, China. Oh, what made them move out to San Jose? A better life, yeah. I guess. <laughs> the American dream. <laughs> what careers were they in or are they in now? So my parents uh, were, well, my mom was a dancer. Oh, wow. uh, and then my dad was like an accordion player and a composer, and now my mom does accounting um, and medical billing. And my dad still composes and freelances, and he sells piano. He worked for Steinway and Yamaha at different points mm -hmm. of his life. Does music, I guess. <laughs> That's crazy. I feel like I've barely met like Asian parents who are like creative in doing that. Oh yeah. At first, at first it was like kind of like I met, was met with opposition, but I think now like they understand a little more <laughs> yeah but yeah. even for them like was your mom like dancing in like Beijing and then um so during the they grew up during the cultural revolution so mm -hmm. she did a lot of traveling through the countryside and she would like dance mm -hmm. I should probably know more about this but um, <laughs> yeah she used to do that and then I guess um she uh it was like her passion for a while but I think when she moved to America like she just got a job and like she's good with numbers. She studied accounting. Um, she went to school here for that, so mm -hmm. I think it's like helped her get settled because yeah. she kind of came here as an immigrant with not a lot of money. So, oh, your parents met here? Um, no, my parents met in China, but they were separated for like ten years. Oh. And then um, my mom moved here, and then she married my dad, and green cards were acquired, and mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, crazy. And was it your parents who put you into like piano classes initially? Oh yeah, like piano, violin, orchestra. Um, definitely got the foundation set when I was really young. I did piano when I was four um, and violin when I was seven. Mm -hmm. When did you start competing for piano? Really young as well, I think. I don't remember. I think I started my first competition when I was nine. It's just a lot of pressure. But yeah, um, when I was nine and I did it up till when I was 18. And how of, like how often were they? Every couple of months. Oh, I'd have wow. to learn like a lot of concertos and pieces and stuff. So to prepare for it, I'd have to practice a lot and like learn the song and then um, compete. And so I'd have yeah. to have enough time in between to learn a whole new piece. Yeah. <laughs> and you did really well like back then with piano like competitions. Yeah, I guess you know I had I think I had potential like. I, d I won a couple, which is cool, but for me, just competition life wasn't really um, appealing, I yeah. suppose. I did some <laughs> back then too. Yeah, it's weird. They like, they like judge you based on like how you dress sometimes too. Like, yeah, it's strange. I saw I saw a guy with a tuxedo, and he just looks so formal and like just looks Dude, spot on. <laughs> people like, and we'd all like get ready in the same room for like auditions, and people would like be adjusting their hair and stuff. I'm like. Is this a beauty pageant or is this a music <laughs> audition? Because if so, I look like shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so on. Yeah. <laughs> nah. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting how sometimes things that don't relate to music get like equated into the overall judgment process. Mm -hmm. How do you describe yourself back then growing up? Eccentric, I suppose. <laughs> uh, tomboyish, gruff. I was kind of like a, a tomboy, like bully type when I was little. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Like I, I was I was really into sports. Too. I was just I gonna like, ask if you. Were yeah, I really child. wanted to be a basketball player at one point. Oh. But um, you know, I'm five foot four. That ain't gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess. Uh, oh, I was energetic and I was kind of like just weird. I guess weird kid. <laughs> did you like school? I really did. I, I actually really enjoyed school. I think I enjoyed it because um, it was a nice contrast to my family life mm. and it was like an exposure to culture that I wasn't growing, like I wasn't a part of 
because my family's like super Asian, but I went to like a pretty Caucasian school. So for me, it was exciting, like learning about all these other people's families and what their lives were like. Um, and I, I did well academically. I was a pretty, pretty academically inclined as a kid. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even your parents pushing you, you kind of just wanted, you were like a high achiever. Well, they pushed me. I think at a certain point you kind of internalize that mm. and um, whatever expectations your parents have, like it kind of becomes your, your own as well. So I was kind of per perfectionist. Um, my teachers all liked me, I think, question mark. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, I had a good relationship with all my um, teachers and I guess mm -hmm general school staff yeah so I liked it what were your favorite subjects back then I've always been attracted to like biology just any kind of science like anatomy and physiology stuff like that I wanted to be um, a forensic scientist at one point oh, wow. or a marine biologist I just mm -hmm. really am fascinated with like how bodies work and like I think bodies are really interesting um, you know, when you get sick, there's like a process that happens to like combat pathogens that like enter your system and it's just like interesting to me. So, um, and I wanted to be a forensic scientist because I also had like a morbid curiosity and I always mm -hmm. like watched murder, like FBI files or what is it called? FBI, there's a show on Discovery Channel, FBI. The crime? No, no. <laughs> I, I just I'm butchering the title um, but yeah like those murder mystery shows I really liked when I was growing up so I was like I want to be the person to figure out why this person was murdered and who did it I want to be the bringer of justice like <laughs> so yeah yeah so I guess in school I like science mm -hmm. oh I also really enjoyed writing like composition oh. um, I'd say that that's a subject that I was good at and didn't your like dad's co-worker like show him a video and it turned out to be you like his son was watching your videos yeah <laughs> it's funny you know like I don't really talk to my parents about what I do that mm -hmm. much like they they know a very um, superficial level of like what I'm doing and stuff I don't really go in depth about tour or anything um, and I guess my parents didn't really know what I was making and they didn't know like how I'm trying to like word this they, they thought that like maybe I was just messing around in a band mm. and like just like wasting time or something. <laughs> um, but it was cool because my dad's coworker was like, oh like my son my my friend's son really likes this guitarist, um, and then he showed my dad and it was, it was me. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> and then he was like, um, oh that's your daughter. Like can we come over for dinner and can we talk to your daughter so I think that changed his perspective quite a bit like oh. he's all, all of a sudden became like more curious and wow. interested so when did you start like self-medicating through music so I w got really sick in, in middle school at the end of middle school and through high school um, I had an eating disorder mm -hmm. and I think it was from just being thrust into a high pressure uh, competitive environment oh. of, um, music academics I was just an intense perfectionist and I think people had expectations of me that were like kind of high and it was just a lot to kind of keep up with all the time. Mm -hmm. So it kind of made me like depressed and I turned to an eating disorder to to kind of as an outlet for all the, that negativity um, as a way to control my surroundings through food and exercise. Um, so when I went to the hospital for that, I was like, you know, bored all the time and I needed an outlet. So I drew, but then I also had a guitar and I started playing I'm um, just trying to learn songs mm -hmm. like I learned my first guitar song I learned was a uh, six feet from the edge by Creed oh. <laughs> I was like that intro is really sick <laughs> it's kind of funny <laughs> but um learned some Radiohead and uh yeah I like taught myself by ear and then I started writing stuff on my own and then I realized that it was a really good way to build self-esteem for me because it's like you know, an eating disorder is something that is very superficial, not superficial like like as a disease, but I mean like superficial, like you are focused on your, exter your, your, your exterior and you hyper fixate on like your body. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, I thought like guitar and art and stuff was really cool because it's something that you can do with your hands and you can feel like, like powerful through creating things. Mm -hmm. 
and it became medicine for me to just like constantly be productive and put things out um, and it took the focus off of my outside self and more more to my inside self, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Were your parents understanding of your eating disorder? Yeah, I think at the time, they, you know, as immigrants, they didn't really understand. Yeah. And they were terrified. <laughs> Instagram. Um, they were <laughs> terrified because, you know, they grew up in poverty. So they're like, you don't want to eat. Like, you're, yeah, you're in America thinking, and you like, want to eat. Like, what's yeah. wrong with you? You spoiled brat. Like, you know, and I get it. I get it. It must be really scary. And I think, you know, with family counseling and therapy and stuff, I was able to get through that and I think they um, emerged with a new understanding of mental illnesses and like eating disorders and like why someone would be driven to do that. Um, I think it ultimately was a healing experience for us all. Like it's something bad that happened but I think it made my life, it made all of our lives a lot better. Mm -hmm. It was expensive, <laughs> hospitals are expensive but yeah, I don't know, your life is priceless. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you went to UCLA to study fine arts and education. Yeah, um, I studied fine arts and visual performing arts education. It was nice. I was there for three years, no, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just basically loaded myself with classes. And I wanted to graduate early to save money. And I also just wanted to go work. Yeah. I was like, school is whack. I'm just kidding. <laughs> School's not whack. Stay in school, kids. <laughs> But your parents must have been supportive to let you do like fine arts, right? Mm, I was met with retaliation. We kind of compromised, like we went around to check out art schools, but I kind of like, you know, they were they were more comfortable with me doing a GE with um, art major because if I, they were scared that if I went to like an actual like art art school, oh, um, yeah. I would just turn into like a an artist. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like. You know, I got the general education, I'm well-rounded, but I still decided to focus on um, teaching and arts in general, so, mm -hmm. fine arts in general. Do you, looking back, do you think it helped you a lot? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I think it was good to expose me to different people, because I grew up kind of sheltered. Mm. Um, and I think it taught me how to kind of stick up for myself and defend myself, because, you know, when you create work in an academic environment, um, an, an art academic environment, you have to talk about it and you have to like justify your creative decision making to other people because there's critiques and stuff. So I think it taught me to be a little more outspoken and it taught me to like have more ownership over my decisions. So yeah, I think that was a good experience. But I think I learned the most when I left college and I just did real world yeah. shit. So <laughs> yeah, the college is cool. Yeah. And then were you already doing like graphic design illustration stuff? Yeah, I actually got my start on uh, MySpace. Oh. I used to hit up bands and I'd be like, do you need a banner or do you need album art? And then I kind of did like, I had my little MySpace network of bands that needed art, so I would just like work with them and then they'd tell their friends and my art would be spread around. So um, yeah, that's how I got my start. Mm -hmm. And then I decided that I really loved doing it. Even from a young age, I would just like, draw and sketch all the time. Nowadays I'm still doing it like for music. I do music full time but I also supplement that income with uh, painting. I like paint guitars for people and mm -hmm. I paint commissions. I had a brief stint as a tattoo artist. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. Yeah. After you graduated college did you first do like teaching or like what was your first job after grad? Did a lot of teaching. Did teaching. I even taught at UCLA briefly. Oh, what were you teaching? At the school. Um, I taught at. Uh, it was kind of like an experimental art school, like for gifted kids. So, mm -hmm. um, it's called the Lab School. <laughs> Sounds kind of ominous, <laughs> like experimenting on kids or something. But um, I taught there, and I did like a weekly art project with them, and then um, yeah, from there I just kept on teaching until. And I still do teach. I have uh, private students now, but. Um, at a certain point, it became difficult to hold a job because you have to tell them like, yo, I'm going to bounce for a month and a half because I have a tour mm -hmm. and you can't hire someone new because you need me. <laughs> no, you yeah. can't say that. So <laughs> it's like, you know, they can easily hire someone new. Or I was lucky to have like a lot of bosses that really did understand like mm -hmm. the choice, the tough choice I had to make between like music and a stable job. So they were really accommodating to me. Mm -hmm. And then... 
When did you form Covet? Is that how you say it? Yeah, Covet. Yeah, Covet. Um, like, I formed probably like three or four years ago. I thought it would just be like a bunch of people jamming in a garage just every week, but yeah. it kind of went beyond that and now we're doing tours and stuff, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, started with my friend, my dear friend David, David Damiak. We've known each other for like eight years. How did you guys meet? Uh, through a mutual friend. Uh, he played in his band mm -hmm. and then um, I was like, do you want to play in my band? And then he was like, yes. So, <laughs> so it worked out. How did you realize early on that you needed like multiple income streams? Or like how to diversify like all your skills and like monetize? Well, I think for me, it, that sense emerged more out of just, it was like hedonistic for me rather than like survival. Mm -hmm. For me, I just, I always need to be working on things I legitimately like and I'm really bad at doing things I don't like. So I figure like, I really love visual art, I really love music. How can I make a living off of both? Because I, I think I also like doing multiple things because I, I, sometimes you can, if you do the same thing constantly, it becomes a job and mm. it can start feeling like you're in a creative rut. So with music and visual art, it's like if I don't want to do music today, I, I, I can do like a painting for a client or something or make some art and I'm still being productive, but I'm taking a break, you know? Yeah. So, and luckily, I'm luckily enough that I think because of music, um, I have enough of like, you know, um, I have enough support from people so that when I do post about my art skills, like I don't need to advertise or anything. It's like those two demographics are the same. Oh. Like people who consume my art, and people who consume my music, like I'm in a really lucky and rare position mm -hmm. where I don't have to like, you know, um, I feel like some artists like they have to get recognized, but because of music, it's like easier to make money off of art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. When did you, like, how did it click to you that you wanted to put um, your, like, performances, like, on YouTube, or even, like, personal videos? Um, I did it for fun at first, like, that's actually how any of this even happened. I got a guitar and I was like, yo, um, like, I want to write music, but I want to show my friends what I'm working on, because my whole Facebook at the time was just other people in bands. Um, so I would post songs and then, you know, they'd get spread around sometimes because they're like, whoa, like, that's cool. A girl's doing that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I posted a couple. And, like, it, for me, it became a way to, like, keep track of my progress, too. Like, oh. I would watch my videos and, like, you know, it was, like, I still kind of do it with Instagram. Like, I'll post a video, but I'll use it to, like, I'll do it to incentivize me working on that song like mm -hmm. if I post it out there it's like I have to finish it now yeah so it's kind of like a cool way to motivate yourself to work mm -hmm. um but yeah uh some I posted videos and some became like kind of viral yeah. and then like I got endorsed and here we are <laughs> was it all like organic initially like people stumbled upon your videos on their own yeah you know it's always been organic mm -hmm. like I've never really put in any advertising or anything I feel really lucky and fortunate I kind of want to keep it organic because I feel mm -hmm. like, um, I don't know, maybe this is naive of me to say, but I feel like if you're just genuine and you just work at your craft and you just are productive and mm -hmm. um, real, I think people can pick up on that. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's important. I don't want to become like an ad or something. I see a lot of people on Instagram, I feel like their accounts are just ads. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> How did your tour in Japan come by? And lots of people like knew who you were and like watched you, right? Yeah, um, it's crazy. I guess the style of music I play, well, for acoustic stuff, it's like kind of like Midwest twinkle emo mm -hmm. stuff. Um, Japan has a huge emo scene. They love like also progressive like instrumental music. They love guitar. Japan is just awesome for music. Um, so I went and then I was really surprised at how many people showed up. Yeah. I, I worked with my friend, good friend, Tsunehiro. I knew him online, um, and he runs a label called Friend of Mine, and he was just like, yo, I'll come fly to Japan. I'll take care of your lodging and, like, you know, book your so tour. So cool. And I did it, and it was my first, like, kind of DIY 
solo touring experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to do more of those, like your personal own like DIY tours? Yeah, I just did a headliner for that a couple of months ago, and it was really cool because I actually got people out. I'm always like, no one's gonna care. No, it's gonna be nobody. Like, <laughs> it's gonna be like two people in the crowd. Oh, no. But then I end up always like feeling really. I guess like supported <laughs> because I'll go out and there'll be people out and I'll be like, ah, oh, yeah. that's great. <laughs> so yeah, I think right now the focus is on my band Covet though because um, we have like a label now and we have a new album coming out. Oh wow. So like this summer. And then, um, yeah, I guess solo stuff takes the back burner because, you know, with a label, they have deadlines. Yeah. But because, you know, my solo stuff is more DIY, mm -hmm. I don't have a deadline. How would you say your music has changed since the early songs you made? Um, I think I grew a lot as a songwriter. I think structure-wise, they're a little more complex. Um, I've been at guitar for like six or seven years now, and I learned a lot of new skills. Mm. I think also at first when I got into the game, like I just I was like, I want to be flashy. I want to be cool, dread. Like <laughs> I think like with maturity, I'm just like. All right, like I don't have to operate at like 90, 98% all the time. I can I can have skills. I can be skilled, but a good song means like doing what serves the music. So maybe I don't need to be flashy. Maybe this is like a simple moment. Mm -hmm. So how do you how would you say you've grown as a person since you were younger? Ooh, that's a loaded one. <laughs> uh, I'd say when I was younger. Um, I think I was a lot nicer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think I was also, mm, I think, you know, maybe when I was, let's talk about younger, like maybe two or three years ago before all this touring stuff happened. Mm -hmm. I think prior to that, I was a little more close-minded about certain things. And I think I was opinionated and I, you know, I grew up pretty sheltered, so I didn't really know a lot of things. And I think my approach to um, music and stuff was a little different. But now I think um, after touring and meeting all kinds of people and interacting with, you know, other musicians, I've my views on um, things that are different from what I believe in. I'm like more accepting, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm more eager to learn. And yeah, I think. The most beautiful part about going on tour and like interacting with people is like getting to know different personalities, finding out their story. I think it humbles me too because I realize that I am quite privileged despite having a difficult childhood. Like, you know, I'm lucky and mm -hmm. there's a lot of really cool, amazing people out there. Yeah, I love that. Other than your eating disorder, what what would what you say have been your challenges? Um, I had a turbulent family life for sure mm -hmm. um, like I'd say you know I was bullied a bit in mm -hmm. elementary school but now I'm the cool girl oh, I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> you are though <laughs> um, and uh, I guess you know I think your biggest enemy in life is yourself mm -hmm. I've battled like really intense depression like was feeling really kind of like suicidal at times, mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes I, I still struggle with nihilism. I'm just like, sometimes I'm like, none of this matters. Like, why even try? Because mm -hmm. we're just gonna die anyway and become dust. But like, yeah. you know, then you have to, you know, snap yourself back into the, into the moment, I think. I think when you I think too big picture, it's like, well, none of this matters. But I think like, if I just focus on what makes me happy and what makes me feel whole in the moment, mm -hmm. I feel a little better. Yeah. Actually, with that, what advice would you have for people who are going through like eating disorders, depression? I'd say find little things every day to make you happy, um, and find things that give you value that aren't that you're in control of, like your appearance. That doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, we're all gonna age, and you know we're all gonna get fat, maybe question mark depending on your genetics. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, so focus on like skills, getting skills for yourself that make you feel powerful, like you're in control. Like I feel so good when I write a song because I'm like, I made that. <laughs> like, 
this feels great. It's so cool. It's like magic. It's like you're doing a magic trick. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, you know, find skills that give you control and make you feel happy. Um, art and music are such incredible outlets. Like my motto is always like music is medicine, art is healing. Um, but it doesn't have to be music or art. Like if you love racing motorcycles, do that. Just find something that just gives you, makes you feel good that you do because you love, not because you're like obligated to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd say, for me what's helped is like stepping back and appreciating little things like a really pretty flower mm -hmm. or like um, a nice picturesque sunset or just looking at like the ocean and seeing how big it is. Yeah. It's like, wow, none of my problems matter. <laughs> I'd yeah. say like just go outside. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Stay off the internet. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. Stay off the internet. <laughs> what does success look like to you? I think success is relative to what we, we want, right? It really depends on what your personal goals are. Mm -hmm. um, success is different for everyone. I think I just want to be happy and I want to feel like I'm at my full potential. Like that's mm -hmm. one of my deepest fears, I think, is I feel like right now I'm at like 25% max potential. And part of my frustration in my head is like, I know where I could be, but I'm not there yet because I have so much to learn. So, um, I just want to continue learning, I guess. Yeah. And then one day maybe I'll reach uh, 60% if yeah. I'm lucky. How would you describe like where you want to be? There's some skill sets I want to learn. Like I want to be better at tracking and recording myself. Mm. I've, I write pretty traditionally. Like I sit down with a guitar and I literally riff it out and I like build songs and I record them on my phone, but I don't like use a DAW or anything. I don't like tab it out. Um, yeah, I, I, I literally memorize everything. So mm -hmm. it's a bit slow, but it ensures that you like learn it solidly and you'll never forget it. Because that's how I used to learn piano, like oh. piano for me is the same way. So I would like to learn how to better record. And it'd be cool to make like a steady living off of what I'm doing. I'm doing all right, but I still like worry about money one day. Mm -hmm. I hope I just don't have to worry about it. And yeah. I can just focus on art. Like, I think that's truly a privilege. I'm privileged now because I feel like I have time to do art. Like, you know, a lot of people, they love art, they love music, they love being creative, but they have nine to five desk jobs that prohibit mm -hmm. them from that. And I'm lucky in that I used to have that, but now I don't have to. So never take this for granted. Yeah. I just think about it. I'm just like, holy shit, like, <laughs> blessed AF. <laughs> <laughs> what does love mean to you? Ah, love is, I think love is, is unselfish. I think it's when you just want what is best for the other person, even if it doesn't benefit you. Mm -hmm. I think if there's one word to describe love, I think it is unselfish. And um, I think sometimes love means not getting what you want, which goes back to mm -hmm. being unselfish um, and being patient too. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's it's different. There's different types of love too. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> That's my my two cents. <laughs> I don't know shit about love. <laughs> Last question. What do you want to be remembered for? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I would hope that I... So one of my goals is when I meet people, I always want to leave them in a better place than when I first met mm. them. I always want to, like, give them something, you know? I like to give, can you tell? <laughs> um, so I think when I die, I would like people... I hope people think that I was a nice person and that I did what I could to better the world. I know that sounds really like, you know, Miss America pageant, no. like world peace, you know, but like I really do hope that. I hope that, you know, people don't think that I took something. I want them to know that mm. I tried to contribute as much as I could. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I think that's important. Like, you know, people take you know, if people like hurt others. I think it's important to just like, you know, do something that benefits the world and gives people um, tranquility. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.